evening, everyone, and welcome to the Niagara webinar series. Uh, my name is Kim Barnstell, and I'm uh, stepping in for Amanda and Steve, who unfortunately weren't able to join us this evening. Um, but welcome. Uh, and tonight we are listening to Michelle, Dr. Michelle Vosberg, who's the archivist at the L.R. Wilson Archives. And we're talking about an armchair cemetery tour for the Overholt Cemetery and the Oakwood Cemetery. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. Um, so I uh, am the archivist at the L.R. Wilson Archives, which is part of the Department of Museum and Culture at the City of Port Colborne. So we're tied into the Port Colborne Historical and Marine Museum, and we are right next door to them on their beautiful grounds. So if you're ever in Port Colborne, stop by and say hi. Uh, I also am an adjunct professor at Brock University, where I teach in the History and Canadian Studies Department. So lecturing's right up my alley. So I'm really excited tonight to welcome you on an armchair cemetery tour. Uh, we do regular cemetery tours. Uh, there's four of them on our schedule. We do them in the spring and in the fall, uh, but I was asked to put together an armchair tour with some of the highlights from those four tours. So you're just getting a little taste of what we do on those tours. And at the end, I'll tell you a little bit more if you'd like to join us for one of those tours, uh, how you can do that. So I have to tell you, I love cemeteries and people sometimes look at me and think, why would you love a cemetery? Well, I, a lot of people think of cemeteries as places for the dead, but they are just as much for the living and they're a vital part of any community. They provide connections to our past and to our future as well. And cemeteries can reveal a lot about the history of a community. Uh, and on our armchair tour tonight, we're going to be looking at the ways in which history and personal lives intersected uh, among the settlers of the 1800s and then on into the 1900s. So I'm going to be sharing the stories of some of the people. Uh, and one of the things I like to concentrate on in my tours is the stories of everyday people, not just the great and good. Uh, I really like to focus on everyone who's buried in the cemetery because they all have a unique story to tell. So the postcard you're seeing uh, on the screen right now is from 1912 and shows Oakwood Cemetery uh, as it looked then. It's really unrecognizable today, so many trees now. And that takes me to the first part of our tour. So we're gonna start a little bit about the origins of Oakwood Cemetery, which is on Lakeshore Road in Waynefleet. Beautiful location right on Lake Erie. Like most of early, early cemeteries in Ontario, the settler cemeteries, I should say, uh, we know little about their earliest origins uh, in terms of actual records. A lot of it is on hearsay and local folklore. So Oakwood Cemetery started in a little corner of Lot 7, Concession 1 in Waynefleet Township, near a little creek on land that belonged to Michael Graybeal. It was known for a long time as Graybeal's burying ground and served as a burial place not just for the Graybeal family and extended members, but also for the people of the Sugarloaf Settlement a little bit further east from the cemetery and those living along the lakeshore on the border of Humberston Townships and Waynefleet's Townships. It was also briefly known as Idleweiss Cemetery for a brief period in the late 19th century. Uh, in 1884, though, we have the first official use of the name Oakwood, when a number of people from the village of Port Colburn agreed to purchase uh, plots in the cemetery and formally organize it. And that was connected to the introduction of Ontario's first provincial legislation regarding the creation, maintenance, and use of cemeteries. The cemetery expanded eastward from its beginnings. Uh, and now the large part of the cemetery is actually in the, near, the neighboring lot of Lot 6 Concession 1 in Waynefleet Township. And many of the names from the earliest settler families in the Waynefleet and Humberston area can be found in this cemetery. 
the stone on the left on your in on your screen, sorry, uh, is Michael Grabeel's stone. So this is his farm uh, on which the cemetery is established. Uh, he arrived in Upper Canada in 1803, bringing his widowed mother and his brothers and sisters with him from Pennsylvania, uh, and the family were Mennonites. He was a farmer and blacksmith, uh, and in 1805, just down the road from the cemetery, he built a large stone house, which later became known as the Rathbon Inn. On the right is Catherine Hershey. She died March the 6th, 1815, age 67 years, 10 months. And this appears to be the oldest marked grave in the cemetery. We know it's likely not the oldest grave in the cemetery, but it is the oldest marked grave. She was the wife of Benjamin Hershey Sr. And Michael Grabeel's wife was Mary Hershey. Uh, so obviously, again, the family connection between the Hershey's and the Graybeals. So I want to shift over and talk to you a little bit about Overholt Cemetery's beginnings. Overholt Cemetery uh, is on Third Concession Road uh, in the city of Port Colburn uh, in the small hamlet of Bethel. Overholt Cemetery began on Lot 18, Concession, concession 3, sorry, in Humberston Township. Uh, in 1796, we know that Benjamin Kinsey petitioned the crown for this lot. Uh, and according to his position, petition, he settled on the lot in that year, along with his wife, Dorothy, and seven children. Unfortunately, Benjamin died that year after making his petition, uh, and his wife then petitioned several years later, uh, when in, in which she indicated that Benjamin had died in 1796. They're living on the lot, and for that reason, we believe that Benjamin Kinsey's grave is the first one in Overholt Cemetery. Although we have a pretty good idea of probably where it is, uh, but it is unmarked. It's not until 1840 that we have the first legal documented evidence of this cemetery when David and Rachel Kinsey, uh, Benjamin and Dorothy's son and daughter-in-law, they sold the lot to Benjamin Overholzer for uh, the entire lot, except for three acres, which were set aside for a burying ground. Three acres is a pretty large area for a burying ground and su suggests that this cemetery had indeed by 1840 evolved from being merely the Kinsey family burial ground into a substantial community uh, burial ground. The earliest marked burial is 1824, but the size of the cemetery suggests many, one, many graves much earlier than 1824, such as Benjamin Kinsey's, for which there were no markers or the markers that had existed are now gone. Just as a matter of uh, interest, I have heard estimates from cemetery experts and conservators that anywhere from 60 to 90% of the pre-1884 settler burials in Ontario no longer have markers if they ever had them in the first place. So that tells us that there are a lot of graves around that have no markers today. That first or earliest marked grave uh, is in the picture on your screen, it's Solomon Steele who was born in 1791 and died April 17th, 1824. He was a private in the 3rd Regiment of the Lincoln Militia during the War of 1812, one of several uh, War of 1812 veterans uh, in that cemetery. Right next to Overholt Cemetery is uh, St. Paul's Cemetery, which is a Lutheran cemetery. Um, it was organized uh, when the church in uh, Port Colburn, the village itself, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, decided to purchase two acres of land for a cemetery out in Bethel, uh, on, right on the west side of Overholt Cemetery, rather than establish a cemetery next to the church in town. St. Paul's Lutheran Church later amalgamated with Holy Trinity Lutheran, uh, re renamed themselves First Lutheran, uh, 
Uh, and St. Paul Cemetery uh, kept the name St. Paul, though. It remains a distinct entity from Overholt Cemetery, even though now they appear to be all one big cemetery. Uh, there are some clues to tell you that they are two distinct cemeteries, uh, and they continue to be managed separately. So I want to start telling you now about some of the stories of some of the people in the two, two cemeteries. So the first one I want to tell you about is this grave. This is Euphemie, wife of John Wintermute. Uh, she died on November the 19th, 1867, aged 58 years. We don't know a lot about Euphemie, although we do know that she and her husband had some marital problems because on August the 11th, 1832, John Wintermute put a notice in the Niagara Gleaner, quote, whereas my wife Euphemia, having left my bed and board without just cause, this to forbid all persons harboring or trusting her on my account, end of quote. We don't know the circumstances or what happened afterwards, but uh, clearly enough to cause a little bit of a scandal, I think, uh, in the local area. We don't know where John is buried, although there is certainly room next to Euphemie, um, and he may very well be buried there. Again, we have no records from this time to indicate that. But John went to mute himself, um, played a rather unique role. Uh, he was one of lo several local men appointed as special constables in 1831. When during canal construction in Stonebridge or Humberston Village, mostly Irish laborers rioted on Christmas Day that year, a result of too much drink uh, and competition between the cork men and the Connaught men for the scarce winter jobs on the canal. And the reports indicate that about 50 laborers uh, armed with guns, axes, stones, clubs, and shovels terrorized the people of Stonebridge, uh, marching about the village, as the report says, quote, in a riotous routing manner and did violently assault, maim, and wound James McEwen, Robert Fawcett, and Francis Boyle. Uh, it took uh, local justice of the peace, David Thompson of Wainfleet, and nine special constables, including John Wintermute, uh, to bring peace back to the village, at least that Christmas day. So we're gonna switch over to Oakwood Cemetery. And sorry, I should have, should have noted that I put on the screen somewhere which cemetery, uh, which stone is from, so you know. So in the early days of European settlement in this area, most uh, cemetery markers were engraved slabs of marble or sandstone, some very plain with just writing on them, uh, like Euphemie Wintermutes on the previous slide, or Amanda Graybeals here on this slide. You can see this Graybeal marker has a very long epitaph on it, uh, but 170 odd years of weathering has certainly taken its toll on that part of the carving, um, while the rest of the stone is very finely and deeply carved. Some stones have much more elaborate iconography on them, in, along with um, the inscriptions. And I wanted to mention about the motifs or the iconography uh, we see on the stones. You can certainly go online and find long lists of what the images mean or signify, but it's really important to remember that their meaning for us or from a list on Google uh, might be very different than the meaning that they held for the person who selected. Uh, the symbol or the motif. So just be careful when you're interpreting these that you say this means this. You, we really don't know what it meant to the person who selected it. We know what we think it means, but again, uh, we can't get in the heads of the people who picked it. Um, and we don't really have many records that tell us why someone chose a particular symbol or motif for their marker. The marker on the left is for Lydia Laporte. Uh, it is lying flat on the ground at Oakwood Cemetery. And there you can see on the top of it, uh, the image of an angel actually kneeling in front of the grave. 
Uh, and this is a rather unusual motif for these cemeteries. On the other hand, on the right, the marker for John Weaver at Overholt Cemetery shows one of the most popular motifs in both Oakwood and Overholt, and that is the clasped hands. Now, again, these are supposed to signify the hand of God reaching out to the deceased or ties of love between family and friends. You will also see in both these cemeteries uh, a lot of markers with the a finger pointing upwards uh, as if to signify the soul has gone to heaven. Uh, there are also one or two in both cemeteries with the uh, finger pointing downwards. Uh, does that mean the person is in hell? Uh, there was no hope for them? Were they a complete reprobate? Or does it perhaps simply mean that the person named on the stone is here, lying below? It's pointing you downwards to their grave. Again, unless the person who picked the symbol left us a record explaining why they picked it, we'll never really know what it meant to them. And certainly you'll see in a lot of cemeteries in the Port Colborne area, a lot of anchors. And now the anchor is a very Christian symbol, but we believe that the anchor was picked in a lot of cases because people made their living on the ships, uh, you know, on the lakes working on the ships. So you know, you have to, again, be careful or cautious in interpreting those symbols. As you can see in both these photos, the earliest markers are often suffering from substantial deterioration. Uh, soft stones like marble and limestone and sandstone are very subject to weathering. Uh, they can also have a lot of lichen and other growths on them. And that brings me to the question, or the subject, I should say, of really reading and caring for these monuments, because these really are treasures, uh, as most of you genealogists know. And I'm gonna get up on my soapbox here for a minute because this is a subject I'm very uh, passionate about, and that is conservation and preservation of these markers. The first and most important rule in conservation and preservation is do no harm. That means for us amateurs, it's best not to physically touch the stone at all. Uh, any physical attempts to make it easier to read the inscriptions, whether it's rubbings or using flour or shaving foam or whatever, do a lot of invisible damage to the, the stones. And over time, as more people do that, it creates even more long-term lasting damage. When we're out on the tours uh, in the field, in the cemetery, uh, if it's a nice sunny day, I'll pull out my mirror. I have a little locker mirror to demonstrate one way of making these stones much more readable without touching them. And on a sunny day, you can use the mirror to cast a shadow uh, from the sun's rays across the flat surface of the stone, highlighting the carving. Similarly, a really good quality digital camera with a powerful flash uh, will do the same thing. Uh, and I encourage you, if you're trying to read a stone that's hard to read, uh, take lots of photos using a flash across the face of the stone from many different angles. Uh, and you can even go back home and using things like Microsoft Photos, you don't even need Photoshop. You can enhance the photos and try and make them more readable and you haven't done any harm to them. Unless you're a professional conservator, uh, it's best again, not to do anything to the markers except take lots of photos and notes. It's especially important and I know it's kind of tempting to clean these stones, but please don't ever again touch the stones or try to clean them. Any physical cleaning with a brush or a cloth uh, removes material again from the marker itself and makes it even harder to read. And please don't use chemicals. Mild soaps and detergents contain chemicals that will soak into these stones, many of which are very porous. They encourage biological growth, so the growth of moss and lichens. Uh, they attract insects and can cause other damage. And even plain water can damage a stone. I've actually seen damage done to a stone. It was a hot afternoon and this stone had been out in the hot sunlight all afternoon 
and someone poured cold water on it and attempt to clean it and the stone cracked uh, because of the cold water on the hot stone. But even you know, if the temperature and the stone are about, the temperature of the water and the stone are about the same, please don't try to even use water because water also contains chemicals, uh, even though we're not always aware of it. So again, if you have a family marker or one that you're particularly concerned about, there are professional conservators out there and they'll know exactly what to do. Um, to help clean a stone or make it more readable for you. Uh, the close up on the right is Lydia Laporte's marker from the last slide. Uh, and because it's out of the ground, interestingly, it allows us to see the carver's mark. If you look down at the very bottom uh, left of the stone, you'll see it says E. Gadsby, St. Catharines. Um, but lying flat, then we can't tell if there's anything written on the back of the stone, which is a problem. Um, and further up on the Lydia Laporte stone, you can see that before it was laid flat, uh, weed eaters, weed whackers were getting at it. You can see where they've carved into the stone, where about the line where it says age 65 years. Uh, and that white where it appears cleaner is actually damaged from the lawnmowers and the weed whackers. So again, these stones are highly susceptible to that. We don't actually recommend laying stones flat. That is not a great way to preserve them because then lawnmowers run over them. Uh, resetting stones, which is best to preserve them, should be done actually with limestone dust. Uh, you dig a big hole, uh, you go buy a bag of limestone dust from Home Depot or Home Hardware, uh, someone holds the stone up and you pour the limestone dust around it that packs it will pack down around the stone hold it upright but it won't do any, any damage to the stone uh, and it is completely reversible so you haven't done any any uh, long-term or lasting damage the practice has been in the past you can see the marker on the left there uh, to put them in cement or concrete uh, but this causes problems because concrete and cement are much less porous and it tends to harbor moisture at the bottom of that marker, which will cause further deterioration to them. Moreover, that's pretty much irreversible. Uh, so any information that's on the bottom of that stone set in the concrete or cement uh, is lost, is lost to us forever. So again, uh, Hire a professional conservator. I know it's expensive, but really is the best, best thing to do. Here you can see uh, another reason why laying stones flat uh, does a lot of damage. Uh, in this case, you can see how the sod eventually grows right over the marker, obscuring it. Uh, and uh, in the example on the right, you can see we'd actually peeled the sod back from this marker. Um, and you can see, uh, again, it's very, uh, it's cracked quite a bit uh, and the lawnmowers running over it have caused that crack as well as uh, the overgrowth, moisture, uh, biologic agents are just gonna do more uh, and that stone's eventually going to be completely lost. That stone is from uh, 1892 at Oakwood Cemetery. Another kind of damage we see uh, in our cemeteries are stones cracking and splitting, often from the freeze-thaw cycle. On the left, you can see a sandstone uh, upright marker from St. Paul's Cemetery. Uh, this was a marker for John Klee, who was born in Prussia in 1817, uh, and his wife. Uh, they lived in Humberston Village, uh, and John Klee died in 1884. Uh, and you can see the sandstone is splitting along the bedding layers there. Um, and in fact, the last time I was out at St. Paul's Cemetery about a month ago, um, the smaller portion on the left had completely fallen off. And that's where most of the writing was. So it has pretty much crumbled on the ground now. On the right is the David Steel marker from Overholt. Uh, it broke in half at some point in its past as it has been very crudely repaired with concrete, obscuring some of the carving. And again, that's not reversible. So leave these things to professional conservators. Um, 
And other stones, you know, they get buried deeper, it obscures a lot of the information, uh, like the ones on the next slide, which are back at Oakwood Cemetery. Um, and again, these are some of the earliest settlers there. Uh, you'll see the marker in the front right is for Christian Zavitch Jr. Uh, and uh, on the left is his wife, Margaret. Uh, interestingly, the variation in the spelling of the name Zavitz on the two stones. Uh, you see that quite often in these cemeteries. Uh, Christian Zavitz Jr. is a very interesting man. He uh, was a nephew of Christian Zavitz Sr. who built a large mill uh, at the Sugarloaf Settlement in Humberston Township. Uh, and before it was built, uh, the nearest mill for the people of Humberston was actually at the Chippewa, at Chippewa and the Niagara River. Christian Zavitz Jr., despite his Quaker faith, uh, spent a great deal of time during the War of 1812 working on behalf of the British, mostly hauling goods to supply the British forces and their Indigenous allies. But in 1814, as part of the 3rd Lincoln Regiment, uh, he was among the militiamen who worked to rebuild Fort Erie after the Americans left it, uh, and he helped to patrol the Niagara River between Chippewa and Fort Erie. But in 1814, he, when he was on the Niagara River, war actually came right to his house. Uh, and Christian Zavitch Jr. is actually buried on his farm, uh, just uh, within sight of what had been his house. And in 1814, the War of 1812 came to his house when some American raiders led by John Dixon uh, plundered a number of houses along the lakeshore including Zavitt's home. Uh, and they stole from Christian Zavitt's family 81 pounds in cash, both gold and silver coin, plus other valuables like his silk scarf. Um, the raiders went on to uh, terrorize and steal from the Furry and Macklem homes in the area. And then they went on to Christian Zavitt Sr., uh, his house and mill. Uh, but while at the mill, there was a small skirmish and the leader of the American Raiders, John Dixon, was mortally wounded uh, and they fled back to Buffalo uh, with the dying Dixon and their ill-gotten gains. Christian Zavitz Jr. died incredibly just short of his 93rd birthday in 1866. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, his one and a half story log cabin stood for many years on what is now the eastern section of Oakwood Cemetery. So he died uh, and was buried within sight of his home. So we're back to Overholt now. And I wanna tell you a little bit about this man, Samuel Stoner, uh, who died in 1890. And we know that Samuel Stoner, we've nicknamed him the Wolf Man, <laughs> uh, received a number of bounties for killing wolves in the area. And wild animals were a very real threat to the first European settlers in the area. Uh, large wild cats, panthers and cougars, along with wolves and bears were prevalent in the Wayne Fleet bog. And local settlers had to be on the watch to protect their livestock and even their children. And the threat of wolves was so great that in 1809, the colonial government of Upper Canada passed an act to encourage the destruction of wolves. And anyone who could prove they killed a wolf by presenting the head or scalp to a justice of the peace or a township clerk was entitled to a bounty of 20 shillings for each wolf they killed, equivalent of about 180 or $200 today. Uh, in 1830, new legislation expedited the payment of those bounties to provide a speedy extermination of these ravenous animals, according to the legislation, uh, and the bounty was extended to First Nations peoples. In 1836, the bounty was increased to one pound on the presentation of a head with the ears attached. The justice of the peace would then cut off the ears and present a certificate to the the person presenting the head, uh, entitling them to the bounty. 
Uh, they removed the ears, started removing the ears from the wolf's head. So you couldn't take the wolf head and go to another JP with the same head and get another payment. So apparently that was a problem. So they started cutting off the ears. And if the county treasurer was short of cash to pay you your bounty, the bounty could instead be applied against your property taxes. And it continued to go up periodically. Uh, and records show that a number of local men received wolf bounties in Humberston and Wayfleet townships, including uh, our man here, Samuel Stoner, who in 1842 received one pound 10 shillings uh, for presenting a wolf's head to the local JP. Now, by 1842, the wolves in the area, except right in the middle of the bog, were pretty much gone because farming industry and the canal was doing much to wipe out their habitats. And of course, uh, they don't live in Niagara today. So as settlement proceeded and the canals grew, Port Colborne and Humberston in particular were growing quickly, especially with the marine related industries, which dominated the village of Port Colborne. And one of those marine related industries was drink. Uh, sailors liked to drink a lot, as did the workers who worked in the marine industries, and there were a number of taverns and hotels in the local area. And one of those taverns was run by this woman, Rebecca Lemieux. In 1855, at about age 65 years old, she became the owner of a lot on West Street in Port Colborne, where she built and operated a tavern. It was incredibly unusual for a woman to hold a tavern license in this the era. Uh, there were a lot of women running the taverns, but it was usually the license was held by their husband or their son or their brother. Uh, but in this case, Rebecca Lemieux, twice widowed, uh, held the tavern license in her own name and continued until her death in 1868 uh, at age about 78 years old. You'll notice at the top of her stone, uh, there's an open book. Now, this is usually interpreted as either the Bible or the book of life, but maybe it just meant the person on the stone liked to read. So again, be cautious about how you interpret these. Now, Lemieux's stone is in an area of Oakwood Cemetery, usually called the Gravelly Bay section, meaning that the stones were some of those removed in the early 1920s from the old Gravelly Bay burial ground uh, at the time of its closure. And the Gravelly Bay burial ground was located along Sugarloaf Street in Port Colborne from around Steel Street uh, to Elm Street. Uh, if you're interested more about Gravelly Bay burial ground, um, you, you can contact me later, but uh, we'll come back to that later. Not all the stones, though, in this section of Oakwood Cemetery are from Gravelly Bay. Uh, in particular, uh, one stands out in this Gravelly Bay section uh, that doesn't belong there, and that's actually for Catherine, uh, Michael Grabiel's wife. Obviously, Michael Grabiel's wife was probably buried next to Michael or nearby, uh, and her stone perhaps fell over and has been placed in the Gravelly Bay uh, area erroneously just for safekeeping. There are some really interesting stones in this section though and I want to share with you um, one particular story of Alexander McGregor and Emil Herman Samuelson who died on the 31st of October 1870. Late autumn storms, as I'm sure you know, have a reputation for being particularly bad on the Great Lakes. And in October 1870, a storm blew in and was spoke of as one of the worst in living memory. On October 31st, the people of Port Colborne awoke to hear the news that a schooner, the Marianne Rankin, uh, was aground on the reef at Sugarloaf, and her crew was stranded on the wreck, which they feared was beginning to break up in the surf. Several initial efforts that morning to rescue the crew not only failed, but resulted in the deaths of three men, would-be rescuers. They were crew members who had volunteered to try and rescue uh, the Marianne Rankin uh, people. Uh, they were off the steam-powered propeller, the Young America. 
Those three men were Alexander McGregor, aged about 50 from Scotland, Emil Herman Samuelson, 10 years old from Norway, and a man named John Mills from Wisconsin. They had set out in a small lifeboat to try and get out to the Sugarloaf Reef to the battered Marianne Rankin, but the winds, waves, and strong currents around the wreck were running high, and their lifeboat was swamped, and they all drowned. It wasn't until late afternoon that people got brave enough to make another rescue attempt uh, for the crew of the Marianne Rankin, who could be seen clinging to the ship. That rescue attempt was successful and brought the entire stranded rank and crew to safety, except for one, the only woman on board who was the cook. She had been swept overboard in the night before and her body wouldn't be found actually until the following July. Of the three rescuers who died, Mill's body was returned to his family in Wisconsin, but McGregor and Samuelson were buried at the Babel Gravelly Bay Cemetery and the marker put up uh, and I don't know if you can see it right at the very bottom of the marker, it says this memorial was erected by voluntary subscription. Uh, and we know that they essentially passed the hat um, around the local town and among uh, all the sailors and crew were, who were in town to try to honor these men. And you can see at the top of the monument or the marker, there's an anchor there. Again, is that because of their Christian faith, or is it because they were sailors? Uh, we will never know. And when Gravelly Bay Burial Ground was closed, uh, this marker was moved out to Oakwood Cemetery. Some of the markers from Gravelly Bay uh, and bodies also went out to Overholt Cemetery. There doesn't seem to have been any sort of uh, rhyme or reason about why some went to Oakwood and some went to Overholt. I've never been able to find out much about that. But I do want to tell you about this one. This is Captain Thomas McDonald, uh, who died on the 26th of August. And then I realized there's a typo there. He died 1875, not 1975. He was a ship's captain on the Great Lakes. He was from Chicago. Uh, and the report from the Toronto Globe called him an old lake captain. He'd formally sailed the schooners, the Lucy J. Latham and the Groton. He was found drowned in the harbor at Port Colburn off the schooner, the Knight Templar, where he'd been working passage back home. His wife and family were back in Chicago, uh, but he was buried in Port Colburn. Uh, we, uh, are thinking that probably his family was not able to afford to send his body home for burial. So he was buried at Gravelly Bay Burial Ground uh, and then uh, the marker moved from there, uh, as I said, in the 1920s. And again, this one has another anchor on it, which I think is more about his uh, chosen profession uh, than anything. John Bradley uh, is a really interesting figure in Port Colburn history. Uh, he wasn't even 18 yet when, as a member of the Welland Canal Field Battery, uh, the militia, he was called up when the Fenians raided uh, from Buffalo in 1866. Uh, so he fought at the Battle of Ridgeway uh, that July. And during the battle, he was very badly wounded in the leg and ended up having his uh, leg amputated just above his knee as a result of the injury. Gunner Bradley uh, was actually captured by the Fenians, uh, but when they retreated back to Buffalo, they weren't quite sure what to do with these prisoners, so they simply left them. Um, and he was eventually brought home to Port Colburn. Because he'd been with the Welland Canal Field Battery, which was a militia unit for Welland County, uh, he received compensation from Welland County of $85 and 100 acres of land in the Great Cranberry Marsh or the Wayne Fleet Bog. What the county was thinking, giving a one-legged man 100 acres of bog, I don't know. I've yet to figure that out. But he also was employed by the federal government as a ferryman on the Welland Canal. He rode passengers across the canal at the foot of Sugarloaf Street, 
uh, such government positions were often given to wounded soldiers. Uh, and we have his obituary in which uh, people lamented the loss of, of Mr. Bradley, who would be sorely missed uh, on the ferry. You can see his marker from 1887 is reflective of changing styles as we move into the late Victorian period. It's upright with the urn on top. Um, this stone has not weathered well, though. Uh, it's very hard to read, uh, as you can see. Also at Oakwood Cemetery, and probably the best known monument there, is the Hopkins Mausoleum. Mausoleums are very rare in the southern part uh, of Niagara. There's a few in Fort Erie cemeteries, uh, and there's this one at the cemetery in Wayne Fleet. Uh, it was built by Samuel Hopkins, or he had it built, uh, in 1899. Samuel Hopkins had been born in 1822 in County Cork in Ireland and came to Canada with his parents as a young boy. Uh, and he had quite a career and a life. Uh, he was uh, very successful financially in his later life. He was a merchant, a tug owner, a speculator, a landlord in Reeve of Port Colborne Village. Uh, but he also was apparently quite a temper uh, and was not afraid to use his fists when he needed to. Uh, and he also had a few death threats and attempts on his life. So a very colorful character by all means. But he died on October the 12th, 1899, having already put in motion the construction of this mausoleum for himself, his first wife, his son, Frederick, his adopted daughter, Ida, her husband, Duncan Armstrong, and his sister, Mary Up the Grove. The contract to build this mausoleum was for $8,000. Now the relative cost of such a project today would be around $2 million. Uh, and Samuel Hopkins was certainly wealthy enough to be able to afford this. When Hopkins died though, the mausoleum wasn't ready. So his remains were temporarily buried next to his wife in the original Hopkins plot, uh, not far from the mausoleum. And this was the monument he had had put up originally uh, to his first wife, Joanna. Uh, and she had been buried there in 1891 when she died. Uh, and then he was temporarily buried here until the mausoleum could be ready. He died a very wealthy man, and some of his family members, including his estranged second wife, his son, and several nieces and nephews, all contested his will, which had largely left his estate to his do adopted daughter, Ida, and her husband, Duncan. But by the time all the court proceedings were done, three years later, there was very little left of the estate uh, to go to anyone. The mausoleum today holds the remains of Samuel Hopkins, his first wife, Joanna. Uh, they were moved there in 1903 from this uh, plot. Also in the mausoleum are his adopted daughter and her husband and his son. The sixth niche, uh, which was intended for his sister is empty. Uh, she had moved to California uh, and she's buried there. So uh, there remains one empty spot uh, within the mausoleum. There has been a lot of vandalism around the mausoleum in the past, which is why there's a steel door and steel plates over what had been uh, stained glass windows. Um, and Mary up the grove apparently took the key with her to California. So, and no one seems to know where it has gone uh, ever since. There's a lot of, stories of ghosts and curses around Hopkins Mausoleum. Uh, again, uh, most of it based in people's imaginations and nothing else. One of the popular stories I hear is that his dog is in the mausoleum uh, and there's no room for his dog in the mausoleum. Uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, and his dog would not have been buried uh, in the mausoleum because uh, Samuel Hopkins' dog apparently died before Hopkins did, uh, and so the mausoleum wasn't even complete when the poor dog died, and I don't know where the dog died. So uh, one of those uh, strange stories that, that arise in, in local history.
So another story I want to tell you about actually links both Oakwood and Overholt Cemetery burials. Uh, and that is to do with the sinking of the tug, the escort. Captain Harry Dunlop and his brother, the engineer of the escort, Albert Dunlop, uh, ran the tug escort for the Welland Canal Tug Company, which was owned and managed by DeWitt Carter. The tug business was notoriously fierce. Um, to keep things fair, the tug companies often worked out arrangements or an informal tug association where they worked to divide uh, the work up equally at agreed upon rates. These arrangements though often fell apart. There were bad feelings among the tug owners and the crews. And they were especially running high in November, 1907 uh, after what had happened in the middle of November. The Canadian Pacific Railway had ordered two new passenger ships, the Assiniboia and the Kiwatin for the Upper Lakes service. But the ships were too large to fit through the locks of the Third Welland Canal. So they were actually cut in half in Quebec and they were towed uh, all the way along Lake Ontario and up through the locks uh, to Buffalo where the ships were put back together. When SS Kiwatin had been moved through the canal between November 13th and 15th, one tug company, that of DeWitt Carter's, had deliberately undercut the others in order to get the job of towing the sections of the Kiwatin. And yes, that's the same Kiwatin that just went through the canal about a month or so ago, uh, this time in one piece. Uh, and you can see a picture uh, in the upper left of them towing the stern section of the Kiwatin through the canal. Uh, and the other picture uh, is of the escort uh, pulling a different ship. So feelings were running high in late November and it was a cold Saturday afternoon, November the 23rd, uh, two tugs, the escort and another tug, the Golden City, were both at Port Dalhousie at the entrance to the third canal. They knew the canal was soon going to close for the winter. Uh, so when the ship, the West Mount, appeared on the horizon towing the barge, the Ben Harrison, uh, they knew this was going to probably be the last big tow job for the season to tow the, the Harrison. Now, according to the association's arrangements, that job of towing the barge should have gone to the Golden City. But since the incident with the SS Kiwatin, uh, as I said, things had become a free for all. So the escort and the Golden City quickly set out from Port Dalhousie, a building up steam and racing to try to see who could get to the barge first and get the job. Bystanders knew what was up and watched eagerly. And another Port Colburn resident named Charles Christmas was in Port Dalhousie that day. He knew the Dunlops from church. Uh, and onlookers said Christmas got caught up in the excitement and hopped aboard the escort so he could have a good view of the race. And it was a close race for a couple of miles as the two tugs raced out into Lake Ontario towards the West Mount and the Ben Harrison. According to eyewitnesses, though, that race ended in tragedy. Perhaps Captain Dunlop lost, let his competitiveness get in the way of good judgment. Certainly the coming darkness, it was late afternoon, was a contributing factor because he seemed to miscalculate the speed of the barge. Observers said the escort, having passed the West Mount, instead of circling around behind the barge, turned abruptly into the path of the barge being towed behind the West Mount. And the bow of the Ben Harrison hit the escort midship and the collision overturned the escort and the tug very quickly sank to the bottom several miles from shore. Lifeboats from the Ben Harrison and the Golden City were quickly put into the water. Of the six people on board the escort, Three were rescued from the cold water of Lake Ontario, Herman Cook, deckhand, John Barnes, the fireman, and Annie Bartlett, the stewardess. 
efforts to find and rescue Harry Dunlop, Albert Dunlop, and Charles Christmas were unsuccessful. All they ever found of the Dunlops were their caps floating on the water. Captain Harry Dunlop was, according to newspaper accounts, considered to be one of the cleverest tug captains on the canal. He was very well respected and popular and had just been hired to captain one of Canada Steamship Line's premier passenger vessels the following season, but he would never live to take up that position. Similarly, his brother Albert was just as highly regarded as an engineer. Charles Christmas was just 25 years old and a well-liked young man, the second oldest son of former Port Colborne Village Reeve, George Christmas. Their bodies were never located, even when the tug was later raised and sent into dry dock to be repaired that winter and ready for service the following shipping season. But even though their last resting place is at the bottom of Lake Ontario, all three men are remembered on their family's memorials or monuments, the Dunlops at Overholt Cemetery, uh, which you can see on the left, and Charles Christmas on the Christmas family monument uh, at Oakwood Cemetery. So uh, one of those cases in which the people uh, who appear, names appear on the markers are not actually buried uh, in that position. I want to talk a little bit about the Commonwealth War Graves Commission markers, of which we have several in both Overhole and Oakwood Cemetery. Uh, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, originally called the Imperial War Graves Commission, had actually been established in 1917 to care for the burial places of soldiers from the Commonwealth lost in the First World War and later the Second World War and the Korean conflict. Commonwealth war grave markers are very distinctive. They're rectangles with rounded tops. Uh, that makes them different from the markers from the wars for France, Germany, and the United States. They're usually made of white Portland stone. And on the top is a national emblem. So you can see here, this one has a maple leaf. Sometimes it has a regimental badge. Uh, and Victoria Cross recipients actually get the VC emblem. They also include the person's rank, name, unit, date of death, and their age. Uh, and for Christians, there's a cross, Jews get the Star of David, uh, and so on for different faiths. Of course, there are a lot of different faiths in the Commonwealth. Now, it's very unusual to see Commonwealth War Graves Commission markers here in Canada, because the practice was during those wars to bury soldiers close to where they died. Uh, and of course, we have cemeteries and graves around the world uh, maintained even today by the CWGC. But I want to tell you about this one of Private Jesse Whiting. His story is a sad one, but it isn't uncommon in the horrifying conditions of the First World War. Whiting was a member of the Canadian Labour Battalion. Uh, and even though they were a construction battalion, they did see lots of action. And as part of that battalion, he experienced several gas attacks. And while his injuries from those uh, gas attacks were what brought Whiting into hospital, it was something else that kept, the, kept him there because Whiting suffered from shell shock, of course, known today as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. He was unable to return to active duty because of both the lung damage and his other troubles. And he was sent back to Canada uh, by hospital ship. His medical records indicate his PTSD symptoms were quite severe uh, and he was under psychiatric care, both in England and in Canada. The condition was very poorly understood at the time and many uh, people considered those suffering from shell shock, as it was called, to be cowards or unmanly. Uh, Whiting's case was one of many that were studied quite carefully, though, by doctors who were struggling to both diagnose and treat the condition. Whiting died in a London, Ontario military hospital in 1918. 
His obituary said he died as a result of damage to his lungs by the gas attacks and made no, no mention of his mental health problems. No doubt because the shell shock at the time, as I said, was considered shameful. And I'm sure his family didn't want that getting out or damaging uh, his memory. He was buried in Overholt Cemetery by his family who put up the large marker on the left. And that was all that marked his grave for almost a hundred years. But more recently, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission has undertook to review the cases of people like Whiting, uh, who died here in Canada while still in military service. And since he was considered to have died as a direct result of his war service, he was determined more recently to be eligible for that Commonwealth War Graves Commission marker. And this one was placed here about a decade ago along with three others in Overholt Cemetery, and there's also several uh, in Oakwood Cemetery. Uh, and you can um, see those, they stand out uh, quite strongly amongst all the other uh, granite and grays and, and reddish brown uh, markers that are in those cemeteries. So he now has two markers commemorating uh, his death. Of course, uh, we now all know what it's like to live through a pandemic. Uh, and certainly uh, the last major pandemic was the Spanish flu, um, which lasted, uh, the worst part of it lasted about two years from 1918 to 1919. Although strains uh, continued to circulate in Canada until the 1920s. About 55,000 Canadians died from the Spanish flu, around 21 million worldwide. Most of the deaths from Spanish flu are actually caused by pneumonia or heart failure. And the flu strain was particularly worrisome at the time because the flu, the Spanish flu, usually affected the young and healthy who got sick and died rather than most flu strains, which affect people who are either very young or uh, very old or who are otherwise medically fragile. Between October and December 1918, uh, 32 deaths were attributed to the flu just in the village of Port Colburn, which had around 6,000 people at the time. Three of those people are commemorated on this marker. They are Roy, Lottie and John E. Augustine. John E., who was stillborn on December the 10th, 1918, his mother Lottie had already been ill with pneumonia caused by this flu for four days. Uh, interesting note, the death certificate actually lists baby Augustine as a girl, uh, but on the marker, it's John E. Augustine. So we're not sure uh, what's going on there, but we'll leave that. Lottie uh, died the following day after giving birth to the stillborn child. She was 33 years old. Her husband, Roy, was 32 years old. He died three days later, uh, uh, both of them dying of that pneumonia caused by the flu. So a young family gone in just a few days. As I mentioned, there were later waves of the flu and Port Colburn was particularly hit hard by a wave that came through in February of 1920. Uh, and in Overholt Cemetery, there is a place where we've counted probably seven graves that had been opened in two weeks, uh, which all were for people who died from the Spanish flu. The first uh, set of graves are of Minnie, Harold, and Arthur Pullman, a mother and her two sons who died within two days of each other uh, in February of 1920, uh, leaving poor Victor uh, all by himself. And that's their marker. And just to the north of them uh, appears this marker for the Kramer family who experienced five deaths in just two weeks in February of 1920. The first to die was Mabel, 
who was 23 years old. Her death was reported by her husband, Alfred. Within five days, Alfred was dead. His death was reported by his father, William. And over the next few days, William would report the death of his wife, Minnie, and two more of their children, Esther and Roy. And again, they are right in a row with the Pullmans, seven graves open in two weeks, uh, all due to the Spanish flu. Now, I told you these, I like to make my tours not just about the great and the good, but ordinary people. Uh, and this man is particularly interesting. Uh, this is Sam Stritz. Um, we know he was a carpenter at Inco. He had emigrated from Russia uh, in the very early 20th century. Uh, and he had come to uh, work in the Cooper shop, the barrel shop at Inco. But he got tuberculosis and he ended up dying in the sanatorium, which is now the, the shave, Hotel du Shaver. But we know that Sam Stritz was a socialist, perhaps a communist, uh, and he probably fled Russia during the Tsarist regime, which was cracking down hard on uh, socialists and communists. Uh, we have two clues uh, that he was a socialist or communist. First of all, the beloved comrade, uh, comrade being uh, one of those uh, signals of language. Uh, and his stone also mentions Maxim Gorky. Maxim Gorky was a socialist, realist author, Russian uh, author. We don't know why he's mentioned on his stone, but it's very interesting that we have Sam Stritz buried in Overholt Cemetery uh, on his death certificate. Uh, his mother's name is noted. His father's name is unknown, and he has no other kin. Uh, and his friends, his comrades, uh, paid for his funeral and for the cemetery marker. And there he is in Overholt Cemetery. And we have to wonder if any of his family back home in Russia ever knew what happened to him. The last story I want to tell you about is the Dominion Elevator explosion, which happened on the 9th of August, 1919 in Port Colburn. Uh, back in 1908, a state-of-the-art high capacity concrete grain elevator uh, had opened in Port Colburn. Uh, and in 1913, when it was expanded, it had a capacity of just over 2 million bushels of grain. And on August the 9th, 1919, a barge, the Quebec, was being loaded with grain at the elevator. Uh, the grain had originated in Chicago from the US Midwest, and it had a reputation for being rather dusty because of the dry conditions in which it's grown. Dust is one of the most explosive things known to humanity. And the elevator at Port Colburn had been designed with the best technology for dust control at the time. But in practice, that technology was not used uh, because that would meant blowing off the dust uh, and any loss in weight would cost the elevator. So they didn't want to blow off the dust and then reduce the weight of the grain. So they never put that technology to use. And it was in the afternoon on that Saturday, uh, employees had uh, come back from their lunch break and they were loading the barge when a jammed conveyor started smoking. Accumulated airborne dust in the elevator was ignited by the heat from that conveyor and it exploded with terrific force. 10 people died, uh, including elevator employees and some of the crew members from the barge. 16 more were injured. It could have been much worse though. A 27 masons had been repairing the elevator's concrete. But because it was Saturday and they only had to work a half day on Saturday, thanks to their union, they had finished work at noon and had gone home. So uh, thankfully, uh, they were saved from this. The elevators had been deliberately designed with reinforced walls, um, but an expendable roof so that if there was an explosion, most of the explosive force was directed upwards rather than outwards. And that was deliberately done to try and protect the surrounding town. Nevertheless, though, much of the concrete ended up right on top of that barge 
next to it. Three of the casualties from the elevator explosion are buried at Overholt Cemetery. They are uh, from left to right. Elijah W. Michener, he was a sub foreman, was 56 years old, left behind him wife and five children. His body was found the day after the explosion in one of the grain bins. Joseph Hannum was a spouter, so he managed the loading or discharge chutes or spouts. He was 40 years old, left behind a wife and a son. Uh, he too was found the next day in one of the grain bins. Lastly, we have another Dunlop, James Albert or Bert Dunlop as he was known. He was actually nephew to Harry and Albert Dunlop from the Tug Escort. James Albert or Bert Dunlop had, was recently returned from France where he had fought for three years for Canada in the First World War. He had twice been wounded in action and he was decorated by the King with the Military Medal for Gallantry uh, for his actions in the Battle of Amiens. So he survived the First World War only to come home. He was at work for less than a month when he died in the explosion. He worked as a Marine towerman responsible for managing the Marine tower legs and deploying those loading legs from the elevator to load the vessels. He was 22 years old. He was single, uh, but they didn't find his body until nearly two weeks after the explosion in the holds of the barge uh, buried below the concrete. Definitely a devastating uh, incident for the people of Port Colburn to lose so many men in one tragic accident. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention tonight um, and your invitation uh, to speak to your group. Uh, if anyone is interested, uh, as I said, we conduct four different cemetery tours uh, in the spring and fall, two at Oakwood and two at Overholt. We are also conducting our urban history walking tours currently um, on Fridays during the summer months, and we have uh, three of those. Uh, the full schedule is available on our Facebook page, or you can uh, see them on our website. And if our scheduled tours don't work, um, we provide any of our tours for groups of five or more uh, at a mutually agreed uh, time. And again, the contact information for that is on our website. So I'm just going to start my video here. There you go. Hi, everyone. Uh, and are there any questions? Hi, Michelle. That was fantastic. Uh, some of those stories, you know, are so interesting. And walking through a cemetery, you know, trying to imagine all the different lives that were led down there. So it's really fascinating to sort of hear some of these stories. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. Uh, Elizabeth asked, is there any regular program by municipal governments to preserve the old tombstones and cemeteries? Um, so it depends on the municipality and the cemetery itself, if, if it's a municipal cemetery. Usually the monuments are considered privately owned so that the family has put them up, the family is responsible for them. Um, now, some cemeteries recognize that families may be long gone, you know, when we're talking about stones that are, you know, 200, 150 years old. So mm -hmm. some of them do, some of them don't. It really depends on the municipality, uh, how much community support there is for caring for the cemeteries. Okay, um, just to follow up on that. So I know you'd shown pictures where uh, the slabs had sort of started sinking into the ground or they'd been tipped over or buried over like grass has grown over them. Do you have to obtain permission to, um, if, if they are an ancestor, um, do you have to, you know, get some sort of permission from the cemetery itself to uh, make any repairs or to you know, raise the stone? Um, 
honestly, it's best to talk to a local monument maker or conservator. I think it's good practice to let them know, hey, our family stone's falling over, you know, is it okay if we, you know, put it upright? Uh, I've never heard of a municipality saying no, but okay. there may be reasons why they perhaps want one left flat because it's easier to run the lawnmower over. Um, mm. So it's always good practice to ask is what I would say. Okay. Uh, Andrew had a question. It was on your slide, the slide directly before you started talking about um, the tugboat. Yeah. A fire. Uh, Beside the marker, there was like a little tiny, um, looks like a little shield or something, a little tiny, just to the left of the main stone. That was for the... It's the slide directly before you were talking about the tug. Okay. I don't remember where that was. Okay. Uh, one more. Okay. So one more oh, back. Oh, down there. Yeah. I see the shield. Yeah. So those are put up by our local legion, there's zinc, uh, and some of them still have the Canadian flag and the notch in the back. So they okay. know a veteran or someone who died. Uh, oh, in wow. service. Yeah. Interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. So that's initiative by the local legion. All right. Um, Carol asks, is there a process to get a Commonwealth stone? She said, I have a a relative from World War I who died 12 years post being injured with blindness from being gassed, but he's currently in an unmarked grave. Um, you can certainly contact the Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, and they will give consideration to that. Uh, you just go to their website and there's actually a place where you can, you can make comments or uh, those sorts of things. Now, if the commission deems that his death was not directly due to his service, uh, then your a relative may be eligible for a veteran's grave marker from the Canadian federal government, uh, but you'd have to look into that through Veterans Affairs Canada. Okay. Uh, let me just see if there's any more here. We have a bunch of thank yous and great presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, last chance, everyone. I don't see anything else coming in. Okay. But this was fantastic. And, you know, some really, really great stories. Kind of makes me curious. I kind of now want to adopt a cemetery and start <laughs> trying to. You know, we... Uh, I have two volunteers that help me with the research for these. It takes about two years to put a tour together. Oh, wow. uh, and for us, it's about, it's about deciding who to include and who not to include. Um, and I often get people are saying, why don't you include my relative or why don't you? And <laughs> you know what? It's just, we could be in these cemeteries for weeks, months, uh, talking yeah. about everyone. Everyone's story is important. We just kind of have to pick and choose. So uh, if one of your relatives is in one of these cemeteries and they got missed, I apologize. It's not that they're not important. It just, I can't talk about everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. You start getting cemeteries that have hundreds of stones. You can't stop at every single one. But exactly, <laughs> you know, it is, you know, my imagination walking through, you know, and you see some headstones and some interesting comments or interesting I, your uh, icons on them you're kind of you, you know you have to kind of wonder yeah you know what they you know kind of person they were or what they did with their life exactly my favorite are the ones with the finger pointing down <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> what did you do <laughs> it is, were you really that bad your family had no hope <laughs> So. yeah that would be a little concerning I don't know if I'd want that like yeah. on a white stone but they're, they're a lot of fun and it's interesting because laser technology today is allowing people to make their stones and markers a lot more personal again mm -hmm. and you're starting to see more symbols we have a great one someone in in Overholt Cemetery has a Canadian tire logo on their oh. marker and they worked there for many oh, many years so oh, uh, you know what we've come full circle 
there's there's a graveyard near us that the person actually has one of those um running electronic signs oh yeah that's cool that's um, very yeah cool. it's a little kind of weird <laughs> we're walking along <laughs> okay yeah yeah but, yeah so anyway i don't see any more questions okay. so thank you very much for this it was super interesting i hope everyone enjoyed it and i believe this is the lot they're taking a break for the summer now so we will um see you all back in september well, thank you everyone it's it's been a pleasure uh I, and again if you're able come on one of our regular tours or just come visit me at the archives i'd love to hear your stories so Awesome. Thanks so much and good night, everyone.